Heute freuen wir uns, Silvia Federici aus New York und Melinda Cooper aus Sydney hier bei uns begrüßen zu können. Danke an euch, dass ihr von so weit her bei uns eingetroffen seid. Auf den ersten Blick beschäftigen sich beide Theoretikerinnen mit verschiedenen Themenfeldern und Spezialisierungen. Silvia Federici arbeitet aus einem feministisch-marxistischen Theoriehintergrund und mit einer operaistischen Brille zur Veränderung von Sorgearbeit auf lokaler ebenso wie globaler Ebene. Sie blickt auf eine lange politische Geschichte feministischer Auseinandersetzungen bis in die 1970er Jahre zurück, oftmals mit dem Schlagwort Lohn für Hausarbeit assoziiert. Eine wichtige Arbeit ist das Buch Caliban and the Witch, Women, the Body and Primitive Accumulation von 2004 zum Konzept einer permanenten ursprünglichen Akkumulation im Anschluss an Rosa Luxemburg. Auf Deutsch erschienen ist der Aufsatz Anmerkungen über Altenpflegearbeit und die Grenzen des Marxismus. Bekannt wurde hier in Berlin auch ihre Kritik am Konzept der affektiven Arbeit bei Negri Hart. Um, I want to thank the Kitchen Politics Group and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation uh, for having invited me to this gathering and also to have organized Uh, this meeting on the question of reproduction uh, at what I see as a very, very important historical moment, you know, a time when uh, uh, our most basic means of reproduction are coming under attack. And at the same time, uh, the issue of reproduction, reproductive labor, it's really coming at the center of political discourse and political organizing. Um, as the experience of the Occupy movement, the experience of the movement of the squares uh, has very recently demonstrated. Now, what I'm going to do tonight in the 20 minutes more or less that I have is uh, to briefly uh, sketch uh, a theory of reproductive work, at least in its most basic outline, that um, I've developed collectively with other women starting from the 1970s when I was involved, as it was mentioned, in an organization called the Campaign for Wages for Housework, which was the political expression of this analysis. And I've elaborated over the years also through my historical work. And then uh, subsequently, I want to basically addressed some of the questions that have been raised in uh, recent times by feminists, Marxists, who have um, basically argued that uh, the transformation that has taken place in the organization of reproduction in the course of the restructuring of the global economy have really made the kind of frame, the theoretical frame, Uh, that uh, we sketched in the 70s and that in its very broad outline I've continued to use in my political work that this has been made uh, in a way obsolete. Um, what I want to start in my presentation uh, from is um, the thesis that, at least in the discussion tonight, is the thesis that this, the theory that we elaborated in the 70s in, in some fundamental way still remain important to understand uh, the transformation that are taking place in gender relation, in the organization of reproductive work, and the broader rearticulation of um, a global economic relation. <clears throat> um, I will read a few concept now, uh, what we articulated in the 70s was a new theoretical understanding of the spheres of activities that have usually been referred to as domestic work, which coming from a Marxist perspective, we redefined as activities that produce and reproduce labor power and more broadly produce and reproduce the workforce for capitalist production. We introduced the concept of reproductive labor to underline the repetitive quality of the work 
but also by reference to Marx's concept of social reproduction, which designates how capitalism reproduces itself and the class relation. Arguing the reproductive work, by arguing the reproductive work is production of labor power, we applied Marx's category, but turned Marx's theory upside down. First, we changed the concept of work to include the reproduction of the workforce. Second, we rejected the idea that the cause of gender-based discrimination is being women's exclusion from socially necessary production. We affirm that it is the waitress condition of housework, not the exclusion from socially necessary production that has been the material foundation of the hierarchies inscribed in the sexual division of labor and women's subordination to men. This theory also helped us to eliminate not only women's position in capitalism, but the very nature of capitalist relation. Indeed, reproductive work has been a vantage point from which to analyze the mechanism by which capitalism has been able to reproduce itself, such as, for example, the use of the wage relation to extract unpaid labor from the wageless, to hide entire areas of exploitation, and to divide workers on the basis of gender, race, and age. Finally, our perspective extended the notion of class struggle to include the struggle of a reproductive work giving a new meaning to the concept that the personal is the political. For instance, we interpreted the collapse of dentality as women's refusal of the discipline of reproductive work. And we began to connect women's insubordination in the home to the combativeness of the new generation of workers. The importance of a theory must be decided not just in terms of its capacity to interpret the present, but also its capacity to anticipate the future. From this point of view, the theory of reproduction I've outlined has continuously proven its usefulness even in the face of the transportation that have occurred in the global economy. However, in recent time, more questions have been raised concerning its utility given the important change that we have witnessed in the very organization of reproductive work. Can we hold on to a perspective, it is more frequently asked, that looks at the reproduction and gender relations from the viewpoint of unpaid labor, when so many women now are working for a wage, and when reproductive work is being reorganized on a surface basis and as paid labor? A further type of criticism comes from the theory of cognitive capitalism and cognitive labor, developed by autonomous Marxists like Vercellone, Negri and Hart, Lazzarato. This argues that speaking of reproductive work was perhaps appropriate to the 40s Keynesian period of capitalism, when production occurred in the factories and reproduction in the home, and the distinction was very clear. In the post-40s period, however, as labor as presumably has gone out of the factories, as science of knowledge have become the primary means of production, <clears throat> and labor itself has become essentially of a cognitive immaterial nature. The distinction between home and factory, work and life has presumably collapsed. Um, all of society, the argument goes, has become now a point of production and reproduction. And in this sense, Negri and Hart have spoken of the event of biopolitical production, which describes precisely the situation in which life is placed at the service of accumulation. Along the same line, autonomous markets have replaced the concept of reproductive work with effective labor which presumably better describes the relational immaterial character of the labor involved. This is a move similar to that of many feminists in the contemporary academic world, who have abandoned the concept of domestic work, reproductive work, in favor of care work, similarly highlighting the immaterial aspect of reproduction. 
These criticisms deserve obviously attention as they illustrate important transformation in the organization of reproduction, which we need to take into account. But in my view, they do not invalidate the theoretical scheme I have very sketchily presented. Undoubtedly, women's massive entrance in the workforce has produced important changes in the reorganization of reproductive work, even though this is not a global trend. For in many parts of the world, for instance in much of the third world and former socialist countries, women have been expelled from many of the jobs they once held. Also, access to wage labor has certainly given women more autonomy from men. It has changed gender relation and made some steps towards the desexualization, degenderization of reproductive work. More men uh, today perform reproductive work and view it, and this to me is a very important, as a political issue. For instance, in New York for some time, even before the, the, uh, uh, the beginning of the Occupy movement, there's been a, an ongoing discussion taking place on the need to create a self-reproducing movement that is a movement that will not separate uh, political work from uh, the catering to day-to-day -day needs, the needs of everyday life and reproduction. Um, <clears throat> and, and this is clearly, in my view, an, an indication of the transformation that uh, you know, may, men have um, uh, operated with regard to this work. Also, the importance the reproduction is placed in the Occupy movement is a good indication of this trend. Um, most important, in the US at least, it is today paid domestic workers who are carrying on the struggle for the valorization of reproductive work that once was at the center of women's liberation politics. Moreover, because most are immigrant women and women of color, they have also placed the question of reproductive work in a much broader context, reconnecting it to the history of slavery, colonialism, and to the ongoing recolonization process that is pres presently taking place across the former colonial world. Yet, the difficulties that they have in having the activity recognize this work indicate how heavily the continued presence of unpaid reproductive labor weighs on the possibility of transforming also paid work, also this work when it is organized on a paid basis. Indeed, most reproductive work continues to be unpaid. According to recent reports, for instance, uh, the largest amount of work in the world, the largest production sector in existence worldwide is still the raising of children. And this work is still predominantly done by women and on an unpaid basis. If we add the care of the ill, the elderly, the care of non-self-sufficient people, we see that the home is still a central place for the production of the workforce. <clears throat> I add that the reform of health care and the fiscal crisis are now returning a great amount of unpaid labor to it, intensifying a crisis of reproduction that is now reaching catastrophic proportion and I definitely mean posing the need to, to create alternative forms of reproduction. Um, this is an issue now that is becoming more and more at the center of the discussion of the commons uh, because the global crisis you know, is showing that in fact, uh, you know, with, with, the, with the intensifying of the global crisis, uh, you know, much uh, of, the, of the work 
the reproduction work that was performed uh, on a public base uh, is now in fact being pushed back into the home and um, I hope to give more details on that, to have time to give more details on this in the discussion. Uh, also, the expansion of informal, of informal labor, that is the, the relocation of uh, much industrial labor into the home, shows the gravitation of pull that unpaid domestic work still exercises, as it is the need that women have to care for children that has enabled the extension uh, of industrial work into the home. And at the same time, unpaid domestic labor still provide a model, a paradigm that employers strive to duplicate in their reorganization of the work process. Um, because uh, it is obviously in their interest to make industrial work as invisible, as isolated, as difficult to unionize as uh, reproductive labor has been. Two conclusions can be drawn by looking at this situation, specifically the expansion of informal labor. First, we should not be too quick to declare the work has gone out of the home and unpaid labor has come to an end. Second, uh, it is also clear that the line between productive and reproductive work is indeed very tenuous and is constantly shifting. Why then maintain the distinction? My answer is that from a semantic point of view, we could unproblematically merge reproductive and productive work. We could speak of production of labor power, production of life, as some feminists have done, um, have already done. Uh, it is both to continue a usage that has gained um, ground in the United States, but above all, to stress the qualitative difference between the production of the commodity and the production of workers, production of human beings, and <clears throat> which who are never completely commodified, that I maintain this distinction. The fact that reproductive work uh, reproduce not only labor power for the market, but the whole person in which labor power subsists creates contradiction, conflict, tension that in my view, it is very important not to marginalize. This is also my response to the theory of biopolitical production proposed by Negri and Hart. And my response here is very sketchy there's a lot more to say than what I'm saying now, but in a very brief. This theory touches on something, although I think touches in a rather confused way, but touches on something very important that has occurred in response to the struggle in the 60s. Struggles, I want to underline it, that have taken place not only in the factories, but also in the schools and the kitchens of the world. That is, the disinvestment of the state in the reproduction of the workforce, generally referred to as the end of the welfare state, through cuts in pension, public services like healthcare and education, and the concomitant financialization of reproduction, which aims to turn every moment of social reproduction into an immediate point of accumulation. That is, the struggle of students against schoolwork, the struggle of women against domestic work, have undermined clearly the hope in the capitalist class that investment in the reproduction of the working class will pay off in the long term in the form of more productive workers. This they have given up to some extent. Hence, the end of the welfare state and the attempt to make every moment of reproduction immediately productive, immediately a moment of accumulation. For example, to the introduction of school fees, to the introduction of credit cards, 
and the propagation of a neoliberal ideology that um, of promotes uh, the idea uh, that um, we are all you know, responsible for investing in ourselves. An ideology which tries to produce a new type of subjectivity, erasing the figure of the worker and replacing that, replacing it with that of the micro-entrepreneur. Also, the mortgage crisis, uh, the so-called mortgage crisis, you know, which in the United States has already produced six million people who are homeless, and uh, the numbers are growing, is by no means finished, must be seen in this context, less as a product of financial speculation and more as a product of a social plan and social discipline of a workforce destined, at least in capital's planning, to be infinitely adaptable to capital's needs and mobile. This, however, does not mean that reproductive labor has ceased to be, <coughs> that reproductive labor has ceased, has come to an end, and, but only that it has been further devalued. In other words, the financialization of reproduction is not the end of reproductive work, but rather its further devaluation, its attempt to further devalue it. It means that the responsibility for our reproduction has been placed even more firmly on the side of the workforce. And that capitalism, <coughs> um, <coughs> capital has taken much more direct control over the state, rather over workers, sorry, rather than be mediated through the figure of the state. Finally, it means that that has become one of the main tools for disciplining a workforce which has been able to refuse the traditional means of control, as, for example, the type of controls that were provided by dependence on the male wage. Thank you. Also mein Eindruck ist, in deiner Darstellung, wie reproduktive Arbeit in der Gegenwart zu erfassen ist, spielt ja das Verschwinden des Sozialstaats und die gegenwärtige Krise immer eine sehr große Rolle. Und daran anschließend halt ergibt sich für mich die Frage, wie muss man sich eben halt die Krise aus der Perspektive der Reproduktion vorstellen? Also es kursiert ja immer so dieses Stichwort der Reproduktionskrise oder reproduktive Krise. Also eigentlich geht es darum zu bestimmen, wie ist der Zusammenhang von reproduktiver Arbeit und Krise, wie kann man den fassen und was ist sozusagen das Spezifische an der gegenwärtigen Krise und dem Zusammenhang mit Reproduktionsarbeit und Reproduktionsverhältnissen. Genau, ich lasse es, belasse es mal dabei. Uh, well, this is a, a, a question that uh, I would require a very broad answer and uh, I'm going to try to res respond, you know, synthetically, but uh, when we talk about a productive crisis today, we are talking about a crisis that has many, many dimensions. I mean, clearly we are witnessing worldwide a major reproductive crisis. Um, wherever you turn, whether it is Africa or, or Greece or Germany or, or New York, we definitely, there are very, some very fundamental elements that are in question. And um, I would say that if there's something that characterizes, um, one thing that characterizes the present crisis is that we are told continuously, at least in the US, that the crisis we are experiencing now um, will be reoccurring and will be with us for a long, long time to come. Uh, in other words, we are no way reassured that there's going to be an end to it. In fact, we have many economists telling us 
that uh, this is going to be a permanent component, a cyclical crisis will be a permanent component of the process of capitalist development for the foreseeable time. Having said that, another important aspect is the fact that the crisis, the reproduction crisis, as, as I said before, many, many dimensions. We have an ecological crisis, we have a crisis of general of the means of reproduction, there is a major, major attack on people's means of subsistence at all levels. And we have a reproductive crisis in the more narrow sense of reproductive labor that I've been you know, using you know, tonight. Now, looking at the reproductive crisis from the point of view of uh, the disinvestment of the state in the process of reproduction, right? And we see that uh, this is something that is a component, is something that uh, is, uh, you know, a trend, not a worldwide trend. It's, it's something that is very much part of the neoliberal agenda and uh, that it is really one of the pillars you know, of the restructuring of the global economy, uh, which means that, you know, the guarantees that at least, you know, were, were somewhat taken for granted, you know, they have been the result of a century of struggle, the kind of entitlement, for example, to health care, to education, to subsidies to basic necessities, and so forth, right? are now being completely removed. And this has Im immense consequences, consequences immediate uh, in terms of, uh, you know, people's ability to reproduce themselves. In particular, uh, the question of women's, the, the reproductive work, which is still primarily done by women in the home, because a lot of the services that have been cut are now being brought back to the home, as I was saying, you know, uh, before. Uh, but it also has implication on, uh, you know, the, 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 the kind of political discussion, political strategies that, uh, you know, we need to, to develop. Uh, because it is very clear that uh, we cannot rely on the state, as we cannot rely on the market. Uh, for our reproduction. I think that is something that it's coming out very clearly from the present situation is that uh, neither state nor market really uh, give us any uh, guarantee with regard to our reproduction. And therefore, as we are struggling against the cuts in a daycare, as we are struggling against the cuts in, uh, you know, assistance to the elderly, or the, against the evictions, because we are being made increasingly homeless. The home too is now being declared as out of our reach. And nevertheless, you know, within all these different struggles, I think we we have to begin to pose the question of the creation of an alternative. You know, like, which I think is why the issue, uh, the discussion of the commons is now so prominent, you know, uh, you know it, wherever you go, I mean, uh, worldwide, I think it's really becoming a key issue of political debate. How do we build commons? What does it mean? Uh, but that's part of the realization that we cannot, that uh, the crisis of reproduction we are witnessing reproduction with a big R and reproduction also with a smaller R in terms of the immediate reproduction of, of uh, the workforce and reproduction of uh, individuals and communities, right, are, are involved in a crisis that doesn't show uh, any sign of ever being resolved. You know, in fact, as I mentioned before, we are continuously reassured that Crisis will become a cyclical component, will always be returning. Um, and the reason why is because clearly 
uh, capitalism is only able at this point to maintain its discipline by continuously destroying the means of our reproduction. Anschließend eben an deine Diagnose zur ähm, globalen äh, Krise der Reproduktion würden wir halt eigentlich gerne äh, mehr darüber hören, welche politischen Strategien du befürwortest. Du hast es ja schon, also sozusagen es, ähm, es ist schon angedeutet worden, dass du ja hauptsächlich auf äh, Commons und eben eine kollektive Reorganisation von Reproduktion setzt, während jetzt ähm, dir natürlich äh, die Strategien wie du, äh, die der Domestic Worker Unions zum Beispiel natürlich nicht, nicht fremd sind. Ähm, und äh, ich möchte jetzt sozusagen noch vorweg schicken, in gewisser Hinsicht ist ja die Strategie der Aneignung von Reproduktion, also das, was man mit Commons bezeichnet, ja eben auch schon eine Antwort auf den gegenwärtigen Abbau sozialstaatlicher An Absicherung oder auch in dem Sinne eine äh, Antwort, die, ähm, das, wie du das selber auch schon mal formuliert hast, ähm, auch aus einer staatlichen Perspektive befürwortet wird, weil damit natürlich kostenneutral Verantwortung für Reproduktion übernommen wird. Ich fände es aber trotzdem noch mal irgendwie spannend zu hören, ähm, warum halt sozusagen ähm, aus einer feministischen Perspektive diese Befürwortung von Commons ähm, halt sozusagen auch äh, dir wichtig erscheint als eine, also sozusagen abseits von den klassischen Arbeitskämpfen. Also noch mal zur Frage so, genau, was äh, folgt aus der ähm, Diagnose der Krise, was ist ähm, der politische Einsatz? Well, I would like to speak a bit uh, more generally about the, the politics of the commons, connecting it with the, the, my description before of the state of the present crisis. Um, you know, it's no accident that uh, the theme of the commons has come onto the you know, worldwide scene uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. I mean, it's come precisely in response to the kind of crisis of reproduction uh, that I very briefly described before. Uh, now, there, there are obviously many today, there are many different uh, types of commons. Right? And uh, what, what, what is a common? You know, it's uh, often uh, interpreted very differently. Uh, so people speak of the commons as the internet, other people speak of the commons as uh, you know, land uh, and waters and forests that are shared. But certainly that discussion is very, very crucial and is being uh, felt as important uh, precisely in response to the fact that, uh, you know, as I said before, we have no guarantees. Now, I want to describe a little bit, you know, some of the strategies that, uh, you know, people are organizing around and then, uh, you know, look more specifically at the position of, you know, feminists, what would be a feminist perspective on the common? I mean, um, across the world, there's two uh, trends, at least the two trends, for example, that are very important. One is the building of solidarity economies. Solidarity economies, for instance, like town banks, uh, local currencies. I'm sure that they are very rife here, you know, in Berlin uh, and in Germany. In fact, I'd like to hear from you. I hope that we can also have a reciprocal, you know, connection here tonight. <laughs> Uh, also, uh, another important uh, aspect of um, another important form of commoning. You know, we always speak not only of commons but commoning because commoning, in a sense, places the accent on the relationship, on the type of relation that we want to create. Not only the things that we want to share, the kind of wealth that we want to share, but also the kind of relation that uh, we we want to construct. Uh, and one of the forms of commoning that has become very common has been uh, the reappropriation of land, has been uh, the, the creation, of, for example, within urban uh, setups of uh, community forms of farming, community forms of supported agriculture, right, that are addressing, and, and many women are very much involved in this process, which are addressing the basic foundations 
of uh, the production. Uh, for example, something that has been taking place uh, in uh, places, for example, like Africa, in many urban centers in Africa, has been the fact that women have, uh, uh, in, in the face of the crisis, in the face of rising price food, in the face of uh, land grabbing and the loss of land, uh, women have begun to reclaim, appropriate, you know, in the cities, any land uh, that was not already used and uh, planting, planting it, you know, peppers, uh, uh, yams, etc. Right? So th there is now an activity that is important that uh, also, uh, I would say from a, from a women's viewpoint, uh, is e extremely crucial because, not for any naturalistic reason, but uh, because women are to this day involved more directly in the process of the production. They have the responsibility of feeding their families. So it has not been an accident that, for example, women have been in many parts of the world uh, in the forefront of the construction of commons. For example, you know, the reclaiming land, for example, fighting against loggers who are trying to cut forest. And, and um, I want to speak now also of new forms of commons that uh, have been developing uh, in, in the United States, in the communities in which I've been you know, involved, um, which I think are very interesting because they are not necessarily organized around forms of shared wealth, but they are rather organized in the sense of creating structures in the community that, for example, can become, you know, they can provide certain forms of accountability. Because one of the crises that we confront when we speak of creating an alternative to capitalism, is that our life has become so fragmented, and particularly in urban setting, you know, that the construction of a common interest, right? for example, the capacity to come together and, and, uh, uh, with, and recognize the common interest has been severely undermined. So that in some profound sense, the discussion of the commons, the building of an alternative to the market, to the state, must begin precisely through that reconstruction of a common interest. And there have been some uh, important experiments that have been taking place. And I just want to mention um, a couple that I'm familiar with. One, for instance, um, in New York, you know, groups of uh, men who have been uh, Concerned, and this is a, is a first, um, with the issue of violence against women. It's the probably the first in the sense that traditionally men have not placed the issue of violence against women, of fighting violence against women. On the agenda has been women who have carried on this struggle, but now there's been men who have, and uh, they have begun, for example, to create community type of structures uh, that, that uh, in a way, uh, can begin to produce form of accountability and replace the need to turn to the police when, for example, somebody uh, perpetrates some form of abuse. And that means to basically bring together uh, different forms of organization at the community level and begin to see how they can function has to recreate what once used to be called the community, but now, in fact, that term has taken on such a conservative uh, meaning that we stay away from it. Um, the other uh, experiments in this direction is being organized by domestic workers who in the States, for instance, certainly in the state of New York, uh, have won an important victory you know, for the first time in 2010, after a long, long campaign, uh, they had seen their work recognized as work. Imagine, in 2010, 
2010, domestic workers, most of them immigrant women, have seen their work recognized. Imagine when I speak that the issue of unpaid domestic labor is still crucial. I mean, I think that this is a classic example. Until 2010, in the state of New York, uh, the work of a domestic worker was not recognized as work, was excluded from all the legal um, you know, uh, arrangements that regulate other forms of work. So they won what they call the Bill of Rights, which in their words brought them up from slavery. And that, but then the problem was how do you implement it? When you are close between two walls with an employer, and so, as a result of that, they have begun to also organize in the community precisely to create this form of what we call commons in the sense of reconstituting a form of uh, structures that can function as solidarity structure. And for example, give strength, be a reference point for the negotiation of domestic workers with an employer. So these are, in my view, you know, the first steps towards important as uh, they, you know, limited as they may be, you know, to create a political response to the crisis of reproduction that uh, I spoke about. And um, the issue, of course, is how to go from different experiments and begin to connect this reality, you know, whether it is the solidarity economy, the time bank with the community, with the communal garden, etc. how to connect them and begin to think beyond the separate experiments into uh, some new forms of production and reproduction. <laughs>